Now, I want to deal with the Last Supper. And to do this, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11, which is the head coverings passage that Paul talks about. You're probably thinking, what, Michael? Why are we going to talk about head coverings? Well, we're going to take a cursory glance through that because at the end of this passage, Paul makes a very, he, he talks of the Last Supper, that Messiah took the bread and took the wine and did the Last Supper. But he, Paul makes a huge point of authority and head coverings right the way through and then he goes to the Last Supper. Now, again, as I said at the beginning of the teaching, today, if you really want to appreciate what we're going to cover, you need to understand the Last Supper was not a Passover meal or a Pesach. Just when you understand Torah, the Gospels are very clear that Yeshua died when the Passover lambs were being slain, which is at the end of the 14th day, which means that whatever meal he was having the night before, by Torah, cannot be a Passover meal. If not, you're saying Messiah sinned. They're his appointed times, remember. His, they, they, they point to him. I think I, we can safely say Messiah knew when to keep the correct Passover meal. But people come up with this stuff, oh, there were two calendars, and he was honouring them, but he was keeping the true one. No, no, no. What did Yeshua have to say about the traditions of men? He didn't hold them in very high regard. In fact, he had quite a few things to say about the traditions of men. If you want to really appreciate the Last Supper, understand it's a betrothal meal. This is what the whole plan of redemption is about, a bride, a groom. In past teachings, I break this down meticulously. I'm not going to do this today. Today is going to be more to bring reverence to the idea of the Last Supper. Um, so let's go through what the Apostle Paul had to say. Become imitators of me as I also am of Messiah. And I praise you, brothers, that you remember me in every way and keep the traditions or the teachings, would be a better translation there, as I delivered them to you. And I wish you to know that the head of every man is the Messiah, and the head of woman is the man, and the head of Messiah is Elohim. So Paul is defining clear authority structure within the body here. This is, so can we agree that so far the context is authority? It's authority. Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I greatly increase your sorrow and your conception. Bring forth children in pain and your desire is for your husband and he does rule over you. People will say, ah, oh, see, man being the head of the woman is a result of the fall. It's the curse of the fall. Throw off the shackles of the patriarchy. Actually, is that what your scripture says? Genesis 2, before the fall. Yah Elohim took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to guard it. And Yah Elohim commanded the man saying, eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. And Yah Elohim said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. Adam was in charge of the garden before the woman was even created. In fact, the command of the knowledge of the tree of good, good and evil wasn't given to Adam and Eve. It was given to Adam, which leaves us to think that it was Adam that had to pass this on to Eve, which makes sense when you understand authority structure. So man being put in charge happened before the fall. And the role of the woman was to be a helper or a helpmeet, to aid him in his endeavour to guard or protect the garden. The man was already put in charge prior to the fall. The commands of not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was given to Adam, not Adam and Eve. Adam was the one that taught Eve the command, which would make sense as to why Paul would say certain things in some of the letters that he says. 
after the fall. To the woman he said, again, I greatly increase your conception. Bring forth children in pain or in toil would be the better word there. Your desire is for your husband and he does rule over you. Him ruling over you was already going on before the fall. The curse of the fall is that his, the woman's desire would be for the husband, i.e. his position, usurping. That's the curse of the fall. If a man doesn't take his biblical headship, it's a natural outcome the woman will step in. And it's not the woman's fault, actually. It's the man's fault. The man being the spiritual head was not a consequence of the fall. The consequence was that the woman would have a desire for that position, to be the spiritual head. That's the curse of the fall. So to understand what Paul is saying, headship, like this is not because of the fall. Like, no, this is Yah's order. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, brings shame to his head. Now, what did Paul say that the head was in verse 3? Was it a cloth or was it an authority? It was an authority. Paul's not just going, oh, I'm going to change my lingo. Now, what we're going to see is Paul's going to use the physical imagery to make a spiritual point here. And so far, the spiritual point is authority. So what Paul is saying, a man praying or prophesying, having his authority covered. So the head of man is Messiah. The easiest way to think of this is, out, look, this happens all the time, when pastors or rabbis or teachers usurp a marriage. So... Um, this is why I really don't like that when people use the verbiage, oh, Michael, can I come under your teaching? You're not under me and it's not my teaching. <laughs> because I understand this. I, I, my, my job is to point you to the teacher. My job is to help you in your journey to understand our king. But he's the head. So... Let's keep going. Every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered brings shame to her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. So now look at the contrast Paul is saying. This is a woman, if she's praying in an uncovered way, i.e. as if she was without headship, she's bringing shame to her husband. This is what Paul's saying. And, he's, and then he makes the statement, this it would be the equivalent of ladies if your head was shaved, which back then was shameful, as we're going to see. Because Paul's going to go on and say that the woman's long hair was given for her glory, right? It was seen as the glory of the woman, of part of the physical design. And so Paul is saying essentially... Is the equivalent as if you were shaved, if you're going to be usurping your husband. You're bringing, and the idea is honour and shame. It's got nothing to do with fashion. Paul is speaking honour and shame language here. For if a woman is not covered or does not have headship, let her also be shorn. He says, if you're going to be shameful in the spiritual, you may as well be shameful in the physical. Think of the whitewashed tomb language, right? That Yeshua would say. Oh, you can have the outside of the tomb looking great, but the inside is filled of dead men's bones. Paul uses this uh, superlative language, so to speak. You know when he's talking about circumcision in Galatians, and he says, if you think you're going to, you know, oh, that those troubling you would cut themselves off. It's written in the English. When you... We know that the circumcision party were causing strife in the early believers. What Paul is actually saying is that I wish they would emasculate themselves. They're doing this to you spiritually, they may as well do it in the physical. Oh, you, 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 you believe circumcision will save you, chop the whole thing off while you're there, is what he's saying. And this is the same type of language that he's using here. If you're going to act shamefully spiritually, 
you may as well do it physically. Ladies, you can wear a head covering all you want. Now, I'm not attacking here. I am not attacking, you know, if people feel convicted to wear a head covering, fair. But only do it if you understand what it means. Some of, some of the worst behaviour I've seen from women have come from uh, what we like to call linen ladies. If you understand the imagery, you know, like the long dresses and it's got to be perfect linen and I've got to have everything covered and they're the, some of the worst usurpers. Again, you, you can dress it up all you want. It's the inside that counts. And this is what Paul is saying. However, men don't get off the hook either. For a man indeed should not cover his head, since he is the likeness and esteem of Elohim, but woman is the esteem of man. Men need to understand authority structure too, which means men, be careful with how you deal with leadership. And what I mean by that is don't put them on a pedestal above you or between you and Messiah. I see this an awful lot where... Teacher, pastor, rabbi, whatever, fill in the blank, becomes almost like a cult of personality. And you'll hear this thing and like, this is, you know, this is why as well, you, husbands, if you're saying to your wife, go and have private counselling with the, with the teacher, you're falling foul of this. You're not taking your headship seriously. You're allowing your marriage to be usurped. So no one gets off the hook here. For a man is not from woman, but woman from man, because she's the helpmeet. For man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man, i.e. to help him oversee the garden. Because of this, the woman ought to have authority on her head because of the messengers of the angels. And everyone goes, ah. And all manner of doctrine comes out of this. So let's break this down. I do promise that this is all to do with the Last Supper. Many translations will actually say the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Almost all the English translations will say, and people say, see, so they'll say, because of this headship thing, women would need to wear a cloth over the head. And this idea of a symbol of authority actually comes as early as the church fathers. If you look at the Greek, the word symbol is not there. It's been added by your English translation. It's added. The translators have taken a little bit of artistic license here. If you're going to be true to the Greek, it says because of this, the woman ought to have authority on her head. It doesn't say anything about a symbol of authority. Paul's making a big statement that we need to understand headship. The woman needs to have headship because of the angels. Now, the way it's taught is that, ladies, you best cover up, because if not, the Nephilim, we're going to get the Nephilim again. Them angels are going to look at you and go, damn. Like, seriously? We've turned it all into this great big romance. Ah. Oh. All commentaries make this passage about a physical head covering. I won't bore you with the commentaries. Every single commentary, without fail, almost every single commentary. The earliest sources in regards to this being about physical head coverings is from the so-called church fathers. Um, here's what's interesting about these guys. They actually held themselves above Paul. If you read some of the early church father writings, they're literally calling Paul a hypocrite. They're saying, oh, Paul, we love what you said here, but man, why did you have to bow down to the Jews over here? Because it's all about grace. You can only, go read it. Well, actually don't, you'll be horrified. You'll want to puke. But when I say these people held themselves above Paul, I really mean that, Yah is my witness. It's all there. 
So this is why I, I take these guys with a handful of salt. The context of this passage is about spiritual headship, not physical head coverings. Paul's just said, the head of man is Messiah. Messiah is not a cloth. And the head of woman is man. Ladies, your husbands are not a cloth. I believe this is translated by something has crept in the house, i.e. leaven, the doctrines and teachings of men. Again, I've got, this is not to attack physical head coverings. Culturally, they were very symbolic of honour and shame. So here, culture preserving a great truth. It's known that the ancient cultures, when a woman was married, when she went out, she would wear a covering. That was a symbol that she was married. But this is not what Paul is saying. Like, because if not, you end up in this place of, again, ladies, you best wear your magic cloth because them angels, they've got lustful eyes. So what does this mean? Authority on her head. Quite often interpreted as authority on or over her head. So people will say a better a way of understanding this is that wives need to be submissive to their husbands. But Paul's using the phrase because of the angels. Like, so this is where it's incomplete understanding. Here's the issue. Who's the head of the woman? The man, the husband. Women ought to have authority or headship on their heads, but do you see where you get the problem here? The head of the woman is man. So how can a woman have authority on her husband or over her husband? People will say, well, your husband needs to be submissive to Messiah. And it's like, I don't believe this is what Paul is saying. If that's the case, how can Paul seemingly be saying that a woman ought to have authority on her husband? And people will say, well, that's Messiah. But what's that got to do with the angels? You've got to remember that earlier in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 6, he says, don't you know you will judge the angels? Why then do you take yourselves to court? Like he said, guys, you can't even judge amongst yourselves. You do realise one day you're supposed to judge angels. Like, what the hell, guys? What's going on? So Paul is, like, he's going to the sowed level here of the plan of redemption. The word on in the Greek can actually be translated many different ways. Let's look at some of them. That's all the different translations you can have. I've underlined some. So let's just go with the ones underlined of prior time, in the days of. So a woman ought to have authority in the days of her head, in the days of her husband. That makes sense. Well, yeah, if you're married, you need to have headship over you. Under her head. So, but this is a ju this is court language under the jurisdiction of. So, you could translate a woman ought to have authority under her head, i.e., under her husband's headship, i.e., she has over. Look, I've given my wife authority to do certain things in the omen household. She has authority under her head. In, the t in terms of my jurisdiction. How about among or with? Oh, that's interesting. A woman ought to have authority with her head. That makes sense if the two become one. How about, I really like this one, of precedent after. So uh, in the pattern of, a woman ought to have authority in the likeness of her head, in the likeness of her husband. That also makes sense. But what's that got to do with the messengers? Let's keep going. Another dictionary here says, uh, it's a marker of location near. A woman ought to have authority near her head. Makes sense. 
uh, before, now look at this one, number three, before a judge or tribunal, a woman ought to have authority before her head. Think of the judgment seat of Messiah in addition to, wow, that, this is getting really good now. A woman ought to have authority in addition to her head. If she's married, it makes perfect sense. Think of a bridal governance here. A woman ought to have authority in the days of her head, under her head in terms of headship. Well, Paul's just said the head of the woman is man. That makes sense. Among her head, with her head, in the likeness of her head, before her head, in addition to her head. That starts to make a lot more sense. You realise that Paul is not being chauvinistic. He's actually building the woman up here. So what's this got to do with the messengers? The relationship between men, wives and authority is also qualified because of the messengers, because of the angels. I mentioned this earlier, should any of you, this is Paul, few chapters, same letter. Holding a matter against another, go to be judged before the unrighteous and not before the set apart ones. Do you not know that the set-apart ones shall judge the cosmos, is the Greek there for world, is the creation. Do you not know that we shall judge messengers, angels? How much more the matters of this life? To make the point, Revelation says to him who overcomes, I shall give to sit with me on my throne. Now think the great white throne judgment. Curtis and I did a whole series on this called The Great Judgment, where we make the case that the bride will judge with Messiah on that great white throne. Revelation point blank says it. People just won't admit to themselves. So if there's going to be a judgment of the cosmos, there's going to be a judgment of messengers. I can only put it at the great white throne. That means you have a groom, the king, and his bride. Does she have authority, let me go back, in the days of her head, under her head, in the likeness of her head? And this is why Paul would say a woman needs to have authority like that because of the messengers. He's already said to them, guys, you're going to judge, you're supposed to judge the angelic host. If you can't get the things in this life, this is what he's saying. If you can't judge amongst yourselves, how will you be fit to judge the cosmos? And then he's saying, essentially, if you don't understand authority in this life, fill in the blank. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the master, because the husband is the head of the wife, as also the Messiah is the head of the assembly. He is the saviour of the body. But as the assembly is subject to Messiah, so also let the wives be to their own husbands in every respect. However, husbands, love your wives as Messiah also did love the assembly and gave himself for it, in order to set it apart and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. The, let's look at the apostles. Did the apostles have authority? Whose authority? A woman ought to have authority in the days of her husband. The, the, the apostles were bridal material. If they weren't, we're in deep trouble because our faith means nothing. But do you see, they had his authority. Like It's not complicated. In order to present it to himself, a splendid assembly, not having a spot or wrinkle or any of this sort, but that it might be set apart and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has hated his own flesh, but feeds and cherishes it as also the master does the assembly. Because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So Paul's going on a little tangent here. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
This is the point of what Paul's saying. The secret is great, but I speak concerning Messiah in the assembly. He's using the shadow picture of marriage to make the point. This means that Messiah and the assembly are going to become one. Now, if Messiah is sat on the throne of judgment, that means his bride will be sat on the, they're one. And this makes sense as to why Paul would say a woman ought to have authority in the days or in the likeness of her head. Why? Because of the angels that are going to be judged. He's essentially saying, if you can't get it now, you're not fit to be sat on that throne. That's what he's saying. However, you two let each one love his own wife as himself and let, see, and let the wife see that she fears her husband. So again, because of this, the woman ought to have authority in the days of her head, i.e. her husband, who's the head of woman, it's the man under her head, i.e. In, under the authority of, in the same way that I've given authority to my wife, in the same way that Messiah gave authority unto the disciples. In the likeness of, here, the precedent, a pattern, in addition to. Paul is pointing to the judgment of the cosmos as to why believers need to have proper headship in place. A bride is not going to usurp the king. The bride of Messiah will not usurp him. If He's not going to have a usurper on the throne sat with him. In fact, it says the dogs and all that, they're outside. Now is the time for the bride of Messiah to actually learn the wisdom required for the age to come. And this is all Paul is saying. He's saying, understand authority now because there's some serious stuff coming in the plan of redemption. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 2, again, same letter. We speak the wisdom among those who are perfect or fully matured, not the wisdom of this age. So what, age, what wisdom is he speaking of? Must be of the age to come, which is the millennial reign. But we speak the wisdom of Elohim, which was hidden in a secret. Well, Paul says that the secret is Messiah in the assembly becoming a HUD, like it was in the beginning, which Elohim ordained before the ages for our esteem. So if we're the woman in the spiritual picture, look at who Elohim is esteeming. In King James English, glorifying, bringing glory to. Paul's not being derogatory. He's, 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 he's actually putting the woman on a very high pedestal, a very important place, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they would have not impaled the master of esteem. But as it has been written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man what Elohim has prepared for those who love him i.e. those who are perfect, who know the wisdom of the age to come, who understand the, the secret that was ordained. But Elohim has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all matters, even the depths of Elohim. Proverbs says that the heart of the king is unsearchable. Paul's saying we have his spirit and that searches the depths of Elohim. This is powerful stuff. Who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of man that is in him? So also the thoughts of Elohim. No one has known except the spirit of Elohim. He's saying, however, that's the spirit we've got. For who has known the mind of Yah? Who shall instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. If you know what you're reading... Paul's saying we can begin to know the mind of Yah. In fact, we can, dare I say it, instruct him. That doesn't mean tell him what to do, by the way. But let me ask you this. Are there 24 elders around the throne? Why does he have eldership? Do you see the point? He doesn't need eldership. He wants eldership. What say you? This is what I believe who shall instruct him is speaking of. 
Let's remember authority. The head of the assembly is Messiah. I am the head of my wife. But you know what? I like to go, honey, what do you think? Because that's the normal thing to do, right? Let's keep going. However, man is not independent of woman or women independent of man in the master. For as the woman was from the man, even so the man also is through the woman, but all are from Elohim. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to Elohim with her head uncovered? So remember, he's, just, he's speaking in terms of authority here. He's saying, do you think it's good for a woman to pray in a usurping fashion? That's all he's saying. In fact, Peter would say, husbands and wives, you're going to need to learn to get along lest your prayers be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 1 through to 10, go read it. And actually the onus is on the man there. For the man, but anyway. So th th this is not like, a, here's the problem. We've grown up with feminist agenda in our society. And guess what? It's in your head. Because you're reading Paul as chauvinist. He's not. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man indeed has long hair, it is a disrespect to him? So now he's going to use a physical shadow picture here. He's going to use a, and we know this because of the word phusis. Phusis literally means nature in terms of the physical world, like nature. Um, I won't go through this. But the word nature, phusis, is used in interesting ways in the New Testament. It's used as same-sex union being contrary to nature, i.e. homosexuality. It's contrary to phusis. Those who don't have the Torah, but by nature doing what is in the Torah. So they're naturally doing it because it's written on that. That's this same word, phusis. Uncircumcised by nature, i.e., you know, or Jews by nature. He's saying in the physical shadow picture. Olive branches, while by nature, grafted in contrary to nature, also the natural branches. It means kind, essentially. Every kind of beast tamed by man, kind, phusis. <laughs> so it's quite a, a broad word. It's also used of the divine nature of Elohim that is promised to believe, believers. So the word phusis means nature or kind. That's the, these would be our English equivalents. So he's saying, does not the natural order of things, he, again, so this is how you know that verse 13 is a spiritual matter, because he's saying, is it proper for a woman to pray with Elohim with her head uncovered, then he makes a comparison, does not nature. Do you see? So this idea of praying with the head uncovered has got nothing to do with a piece of cloth. In fact, the physical that he's using is, essentially he's saying, is it disrespectful for a man to look like a woman? That's the point he's trying to say. And if a woman has long hair, it is an esteem to her now listen to this. Everyone misses this. Because the long hair has been given to her over against a veil. He's making the point, the woman doesn't need a veil because she has long hair. That is her natural veil. If, now this is where he gets a bit brutal. If, however, anyone seems to be contentious, we do not have such a habit, nor do the assemblies of Elohim. So Paul goes through this whole authority headship structure. He then makes a shadow picture statement, you know, men, women. He says, however, don't argue over this stuff because we do not have that habit. That, that we do not have such a habit is not speaking of head coverings. It's speaking over being contentious. He's saying, don't be contentious over this stuff, i.e. the physical shadow picture stuff. 
In declaring this, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, I hear that when you come together as an assembly, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. So Paul's saying, headship authority, you've now got divisions. This means you're not understanding headship authority. Paul is speaking of factions in the context of spiritual headship, meaning these factions were probably a result of usurping. He's saying you, you don't understand this stuff. Nothing new under the sun. Go look at today. People don't understand authority. Look at the division in the body. Usurping caused a faction between mankind and Elohim at the fall of man. That's how serious it is. What Eve did was she pulled herself away from the authority of her husband and put herself under the authority of the adversary. It's an authority thing, not a physical thing. This is why it's very careful, uh, why I say men, be very careful how you view leadership because if you're viewing them as the way to Messiah, you're praying with your head covered. For there have to be factions among you so that the approved ones might be revealed among you. Dokimos in the Greek, approved means tested by fire. He's saying, okay, we don't want division, but a division will show who's really tested by fire. Because it does. Fractions, factions, divisions, testing, siftings. You'll find out who's uh, worth their salt. So when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the master's supper. Ah, here we go, last supper. But notice that Paul is saying... He's explaining the basics of spiritual headship, taking it back to the garden, saying this is how it was from the beginning. By the way, you guys clearly don't get this because there's all this division and faction among you. And now this is coming into your worship when you partake of the Master's Supper. Which, uh, let's keep going. For when you eat... Each one eats his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. You're dragging this thing through the mud. Have you not houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the assembly of Elohim and shame those who have not? This is where you get in the factions, the divisions, and the usurping, acting as if you're uncovered. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise for I received from the Master that which I also delivered to you, that the Master Yeshua in the night in which he was delivered took up bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Paul's making it very clear that the Last Supper, this Master's Supper, is not the Pesach here. Because we know from the Gospel accounts this is happening the night before. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the master until he comes. Because Messiah said that this is, you know, this is my body, this is my blood, that for the renewed covenant. So that whoever should eat of this bread or drink this cup of the master unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the master. This is a statement that people don't fully understand, but hopefully it will make more sense today. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. What was going on in Corinth, they were disregarding each other. They were getting drunk at this thing. They were, you know... Uh, being lascivious and they were not honouring the poor in this as you can see another is drunk and you're despising the assembly and those who don't have that's how they were guilty of the body and the blood of the master but I believe this is actually a lot deeper let a man examine himself so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup so what are we to be examining ourselves of? 
Because Paul is saying, essentially what Paul is saying, there's some people that should not be partaking of this. This is another reason you know the Last Supper is not speaking of the Passover meal. Because the Passover meal is for all of those that are in covenant. Is it not? For the house of Israel. For one who is eating and drinking unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the master. What's the body of the master? The assembly. Ah. Are there different roles and functions within the assembly? Ah, so how are they not discerning the body of the master? One of the warnings we're given is not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Keep that in the back of your mind. Paul is saying that we're unworthy to partake of the bread and the wine whilst in a state of usurping. He's actually said, like, and you know, this is why it pains me because you, you know, you, it, I'm going to paint a broad brushstroke here, but the idea of communion. You know, is big in Christianity. Like in the Adventists where I was raised in, you do communion every quarter. And only those that are baptized get to have communion and they make this big thing. The amount of usurping in that denomination, in a lot of denominations, is just astounding. Absolutely astounding, you know, wives going to the pastor, not to their husbands. Pastors knowingly giving counsel to wives, say, completely circumventing the husband and then wondering why there's loads of bad fruit. Husbands putting leadership on such a pedestal, they may as well be worshipping the leadership and not Messiah. Both parties are being guilty here, like in... Oh, but we did our communion. Paul's saying, don't. You're not, if you're, you're deluding yourself. Remember that to dine with Messiah is a bridal statement. Our king will not have a usurper for a bride, nor will he have usurpers as wedding guests. Remember, there's a bride, there's guests, and those who are outside, all of them are quote-unquote saved, paid for by the blood of the Lamb, protected, hovered over. I believe what Paul is saying, some people should not be partaking of the Last Supper, so to speak. They're not discerning the body, they're thinking they're higher than they ought to be. Yeshua sure would say, when you go to the feast, the wedding feast, don't sit at the top of the table lest the master knock you down a peg or two. What does he say? Sit at the bottom so the master can bring you up. Because of this, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. I believe Paul is speaking of the spirit of delusion here. In Isaiah it says that when we praise him with our lips and keep our hearts far from him, the spirit of deep sleep comes upon us. It's Isaiah 29 verse 13. That's a form of usurping. You're giving it all the praise and all of this. You're keeping your heart far from him. You're making the faith about you. You're putting yourself above everybody else because look at how great I look on the outside. Look at what he was saying about the Corinthians. He says, you guys are drunk. You're not minding the poor among you. And you're taking part of this master's supper. How dare you? is what he's saying. For if we were to examine ourselves, we would not be judged. And this is why what it, it does grieve me when I see these communion ceremonies. You mean the requirement to partake of this is that you got wet in baptism? But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the master that we should not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I shall set in order when I come. Why did I go through all of this? Let me ask some questions. 
Who partakes of the bread and wine during a betrothal ceremony? Bride and groom. Anybody else? No. Let me ask this. Will all believers be the quote-unquote bride? No. Do you see what I'm trying to say here and what Paul is saying? Some of you think you're higher than you ought to be and you're partaking of this meal. You're deluding yourself thinking you're ready to be the bride yet. Not Passover, not Pesach. Who partook of the bread and the wine at the Last Supper? Messiah and the disciples. What about the rest of Judah? Were they at the Last Supper? No. No, we're not. Does that mean he didn't love them? He didn't die for them? He didn't bleed for them? Of course he did. The point I'm trying to say is that there are, there's the house of Israel and then there are those that are more intimate and those that are not. That's what the parable of the ten virgins is all about. They're all in the camp. They're all saved, but five don't get to go to a wedding feast. What happened to Judas when he partook of the bread and the wine unworthily? Do you see, like, we're given a shadow picture of what happened when someone eats of that unworthily judgment. Judas was deluded as well, by the way. Hence why Paul would say, because you're partaking of this meal when you ought not to be, many of you sleep. It's delusion talk from the prophets. And I'm, I'm going to make a bold statement. There's a lot, vast proportions of the body now that are deluded into thinking they should be partaking of the Last Supper. Not Pesach, a separate thing. The point I'm trying to say is that the Last Supper was between Messiah and his bride. Why do I bring this up? Because when I first started to realise that Pesach and the Last Supper were separate things, my wife and I decided to honour the Last Supper ourselves. And it wasn't long after the fir first starting to realise that I started, like, then came the question, hang on a minute, should I? In light of what Paul says. Because people are like, like, again, let's use communion as the example. J just put on the religious show. Give me my little cup, give me my little wafer, I'm in the club. Because I'm partaking of communion, I'm better than you. You're not baptized. And this is what Paul's addressing. It's full on usurping, it's bridezilla. Yah's not going to have that on the throne with him. And so this is where I'm going with this. Like, this is a serious thing, the Last Supper. If people want to honour it, the masters, it's clear that the early assembly was, however that looked. But Paul's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Be very careful. This is why I believe he says, you are not discerning the body of the master. He's saying, you think you're the bride, you're not. You're not discerning who's who in the body. So that whoever should eat of this bread or drink of this cup of the master unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the master. Hence, look at Judas. That's the example we've been given. And so the idea of the Last Supper for me is actually quite a reverential, almost frightening one. Am I worthy or even should I partake of it? Do you see the point? It's not something that I would do with someone just, ah, oh, let's, let's do it. Anyway, two points if you want to take two points from this, throw the word Passover out your vocabulary. Pesach will do. Because 
Our Elohim did not hop, skip, wobble over his people. He covered them. He protected them. He covers them. He will cover them. It's important. And the Last Supper, examine yourself. Let's truly examine ourselves. I do believe that everybody has the potential to be the bride. The only thing that's standing in the way of that is you and your sovereignty and your repentance. Yah's not capricious. He doesn't just give, like say, well, you can have this, but you can't. Everyone has the same opportunity. Everyone has the same test. Here we are in this life. But if you're going, if you feel led or convicted to honour the Last Supper, just be careful about it. And not in the, like, I'm not trying to, you know, put like this magic thing where if you take of it, now you're going to be cursed, or if you take of it, you're going to have, like, that's not what I'm trying to say. Is remember these things are shadow pictures to teach us a weightier matter. What is the weightier matter of Pesach, the Last Supper? Because I'll finish with this. The weightier matter takes us before creation and after creation. Let's stop here. Amen.